All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Happy Thursday. Here's we are going to be doing the training for Professional Success 101, how to get a raise or get promoted. I think that's all of us that we want to learn about that. And I can actually only speak from my own personal experience, being able to be rising all the way to the top of the various companies that I've been part of, starting on senior level, as well as being a manager, you know, managing over 40 employees over the years you know, I know what it takes to be an employee because I was one and what it takes to be a manager. So again, a lot of this training that you're going to be learning about today is stuff that I wish I was told when I was in your shoes so that I could move along faster, make more money, make a bigger difference, etc. So let's talk about what we're going to be learning today. Uh, what were my biggest mistakes as an employee? Yes, I made mistakes and I want you to learn from them. Uh, learn the five skills to become a successful manager, right? Uh, because in order for me to do well, I had to do these things so that my bosses felt comfortable enough to say, you know what, Tim, we should promote you. We want you to actually be in a position of, of management. Then uh, the other thing is delegation. There are five steps to effectively delegate and assign tasks to other people. And I'm going to share with you what those are. And then I'm going to tell you to discover the biggest myth to getting ahead. Again, I bet all of you have heard of this phrase, in order to get ahead, you have to do this. And I'm going to actually give you proof of why that it doesn't always uh, is or that's not always the case and that's that statement's not really true and we'll talk about that uh once you are a manager or even if you're an employee i think it's important that you know what a really good manager is and i will share with you what the responsibilities are because a lot of us are maybe eager to be promoted to be in a position of management but hey with uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And so you need to know what that is. And then I'm gonna tell you five steps to get a raise or promoted all along the job uh, application process from all the way from when you're applying for a job to you know, you're hired and you're having meetings with your manager to you know, your evaluation time, what are those steps? And I will share with you a very powerful video at the end of this presentation from a famous uh, you know, uh, speaker and author and successful uh, career businesswoman who talks about how to get raise and promotion. So I think you'll all enjoy it. It's one of my favorite videos that really does a great job summarizing these different ideas and points. So let's jump in. So all of you by now should know my story, but it's worth a little bit repeating. Again, in college, I was very active as a student leader. I was president of the Environmental Science Club. I was a board member, technically like the president of the chapter of the New York Public Interest Research Group at my school. I started my own chapter of the National Society of Leadership and Success. So I was just such a very, very active student leader, always in positions of leadership. I became president of the student government. I received outstanding student leadership awards because I had great mentors, attended all these different leadership retreats. I even did my own leadership retreats because I needed to train the other future leaders. And then after college, did an internship with the EPA, then worked for a local councilman. So I did a lot of years in government. And even then I was going back and training my uh, college students. So the why do I tell you all this background over again, even though most of you know who I am and my background? Well, I'm sharing this with you because if you were in my position and you had all this experience, you would think that, you know what? You're awesome. You're pretty good at what you do. You got the skills that you need to succeed, move up ahead. And so when I decided to work for the National Society of Leadership and Success, I thought, you know what? I'm going to be, you know, the vice president in a year or two going at this rate. So this is the image and my perception of myself. If you've ever seen the movie Titanic, you see Leonardo DiCaprio. He stands at the edge of the boat and says, I'm king of the world. That's how I felt. I said, listen, compared to all my peers, look how far I am ahead of those other people. But guess what? Once you start to work in a business or corporate atmosphere, you start to realize that you know nothing. And so when I thought that I was the king of the world, in reality, 
I was a king of a bathtub. Okay, just a little pool of water like this dog. And so that's what the really reality is. And I'm actually one of the things that I want to share this whole experience is because many students right now are graduating college thinking that, you know what, I'm going to be awesome. I'm going to lead. I've been all these leadership positions. I'm going to be promoted, you know, but guess what? There are so many skills and things that you need to develop so much trust that, you know, you need to, um, I guess, earn from your different jobs that they're not going to just promote you uh, to the senior level right away. And it also depends on the size of the company, right? The larger it is, the more of a formal process that they might have in order for you to get promoted or get ahead. A smaller company might actually be a little bit quicker because they need people, they need resources. You seem to be the most knowledgeable because of those share of people, but doesn't necessarily mean you have all the skills and that there's a lot to learn. So let me start off with first being an employee. So I'm hired by the National Society of Leadership and Success, and I think I'm awesome. And then I start to realize that uh, you know what, they have a culture of, hey, you know what, we wanted everybody to be like a family, we wanted to be like a community. And so I'm a very outgoing extrovert, I'm a high eye on the disc scale. So guess what I was doing? I was talking to people, feeling connected. It was almost like the environment that I had worked in was almost like a fraternity and sorority. There were all these young professionals all my age. So again, it was just a fun, friendly atmosphere. But I realized, guess what? I thought I spent so much time talking and connecting and building relationships that I actually wasn't doing all the work that I could have been doing. And so that's something I got feedback and learned later on. The next thing I, I did, which was a big mistake, is I got easily distracted. Remember high eyes on the disc, how you can become easily distracted with things? So where were the distractings coming from? I was getting emails. Here's an email from, your, uh, from this person or that person. So I would read every email, try to answer every email, try to keep your inbox you know, up to date every second you have, make sure that you know, uh, it, it's addressed. But guess what? Many times the emails and everything that you get are not important. And so I had to really learn that later. You know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just seeing Susan's comment, you know, uh, you know, anyone that's willing to hire a person that hasn't really worked in 18 years? Well, listen, uh, that that's really funny, because in the end, as long as you actually have the skills uh, that a job or company is working for, use it, apply it. Um, I've also, you know, we have another training, uh, Susan, that we could also recommend that you can check out. It's worth watching again, which was the secrets to getting your dream job or internship. But as a person who's been applying to different jobs right now, one of the things that I realized how important a personal professional network is. So all of you who uh, you know may not be using LinkedIn, it is one of the most powerful social media tools. And yes, I call it a social media tool, even though it's kind of different, it's more professional. It is very important to like, create connections, have a good outline, uh, find out who all your friends are working at different companies, because many times, I would have submitted an application to apply for a job and I would have been bypassed, but knowing that somebody works there and that they know me and can vouch for me, that HR person might give that candidate another chance to give a great first impression. So, uh, you know, um, you know that, that's a helpful tip. So again, uh, a great uh, job using LinkedIn, uh, you know, and I see that, that that's great, Susan, uh, but not to its full potential. I think it's great that you could use uh, LinkedIn to its full potential. I have actually, just as a side tangent, because it's worth talking about, because we're talking about all professionalism, I have applied to different jobs and I don't hear anything back. I personally pay for a premium level of LinkedIn. Again, I know that not everybody can afford that or do that, but I have access to find people and senior uh, officials or people who work in the talent acquisition departments. And uh, sometimes, even though I applied, one week later, I'll follow up and say, hey, I sent my application here again, here's my resume. And you'd be surprised, maybe out of the 15 or different places that I applied for, you know, I'm just throwing out a number, maybe a couple of them I wouldn't have never heard of, but because I sent that follow-up email uh, via LinkedIn, 
I got a response and I would have probably never gotten a response had I not done that. Now there's other ways to do that, to search online, find their contact information, but LinkedIn doesn't always share who that person is that's responsible for reviewing those applications. So again, I'm going off on a tangent, but I think I, I wanted to help support you, Susan, on that uh, aspect. Okay. So getting back to the training. All right. The next thing that I did, which was a problem, was I was a perfectionist. I was what you call an unsolicited helper <laughs> because I believed in continuous improvement, always wanting to add value, helping people. You know what? I would help out. Hey, we have a survey, employee survey. Uh, you know, we're having these products of different shirts or T-shirts or sweaters or swag that we want to sell. Can we get your feedback? Sure. Let me be a team player, help all these people out. But guess what? Is that part of my job? No. Am I maybe scor scoring some brownie points in when there's company evals of saying, what have you done to help the company, depending on the company culture? Yeah, I may have got a couple bonus points. But what is the purpose of scoring all these brownie points if you're not doing your job to the best of your ability? So again, uh, and, and, and that's different between people asking you for help. Sometimes I would find mistakes and I would tell people because I was a perfectionist, but no, who asked me for my opinion? That wasn't my job. And I remember people, you know, coming up to me jokingly, because sometimes people can use humor to actually tell you the truth. They say, Tim, what the heck do you do all day? I feel like all you do is, is, is like critique other people and their work. And there was some truth into that because, again, I wanted to be perfect, wanted to be the helper. So, again, if nobody's asking for your opinion, if it doesn't actually affect you in a profound way or deeply uh, negatively impact the company, focus on what you need to do. People are doing the best of their ability. The next thing that I was doing, what I was called, is I was a workaholic martyr. So, guess what? Some of you may... Uh, identify with this. I, I think I may have talked about this in, in previous training sessions. Um, you'd be surprised how much people really say how busy they are. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Well, the busiest people that I know are people who work full time, go to school full time, and have children full time. Those are people that I really believe <laughs> have a full plate right? Um, a lot of other people who say that they're busy and don't have a lot of time, well, guess what? If you're a high performer, you always have time to do the things that you really want to do. And so um, remember, I was doing stuff. I was talking to people. I was writing emails. And then guess what? I still had my job to do, and I was ending up working at very late. I was leaving at the same hours. You know, if we were supposed to leave at five, I was leaving at 6.30. Why? Because I needed to do my work. And guess what? The president and founder of the company, Gary, would say, wow, Tim, you're really working really hard. You're staying very late because it was perceived that I was working really hard, which into my, my opinion, I really was. But as you get older, as I started to go into management, one of the things that I, they discovered is I wasn't as productive as I could have been. So to me, I now have a different lens upon people who say, oh, I'm working so hard. I'm staying late. I, I would ask them, why are you standing so late? What are you doing the rest of the time that you're spending so much time that you, you can't actually get your job done within the hours of the day? Maybe you need to reevaluate that. Maybe they are doing so much work, but guess what? If you're doing so much work and then staying late, are you burning the candlestick at both ends and suddenly you're going to burn out? And how, uh, you know, and, and speaking, and I'm going to talk about more stories of how I did that, Listen, I burned myself and I didn't get promoted and I didn't get, uh, you know, based on doing all this work, which I'll share a little bit later. So uh, we'll talk about that, but that's just a little teaser. So again, don't be a workaholic martyr. Don't go around telling everybody how busy you are, okay? Like I shared with you before, and I think in one of the previous trainings uh, about, I think it was the biggest challenge leaders face and mastering success habits. We talked about the biggest challenge is time. And so if you're really having a great manager and you basically, uh, they give you an assignment and you're already doing all this work, you don't, you know, sometimes you'll feel bad. Like I just have to do it because the boss told me to do it. You can basically go back to your boss and say, Hey boss, 
I, I got it. You want me to do X, Y, and Z. I'm currently doing this A, B, and C. Where does this thing that you're asking me, X, Y, Z, follow into those priorities? Should I deprioritize this or is this a number one priority? And just by asking that question, you can gauge, oh, yeah, yeah, this comes before all of that. I don't even care about all this stuff. Do this. And so now you can reshuffle and reprioritize and so that you don't have to feel like I have to do everything. You know, uh, uh, judgment and self-righteous. I was overly critical. I, I would assume that that people screwed up because I had such a high standard for myself. So I'm like, why did this happen? And I remember one day that my uh, manager basically had a conversation with me and I wrote an email to a person saying, hey, they, they made a mistake. They screwed up. It was a very kind of cold and sensitive email that was came across very critical. And I'm lucky that I had great mentors that knew who I was and, and knew that, that my email communication wasn't really representative of who I was as a person. But they talked to me aside and he says, Tim, you know what? Before you start criticizing somebody, anything, you have to understand something. People are doing the best job that they can. Okay. Yes, mistakes happen, but first try to find out why before you actually make an assumption that somebody screwed up. And that was very helpful for me with management, with everything is, this is what Stephen Covey said, first seek to understand, then be understood. Good managers do that. Bad managers are just looking for blame. Okay. And then the last thing was inappropriate jokes. Because this was the time period many, many years ago where the office, uh, which, you know, people are still watching that show, uh, you know, there was just so much humor and laughter where anytime somebody would say something funny, it would be, that's what she said. And even though I made jokes and nobody apparently was offended and people, colleagues, women, men would make jokes, uh, you know, dirty jokes back at me, uh, I thought it was fine. And, and the company basically, even the president thought my jokes were funny. At one point they were actually, uh, I was typing up the jokes and sending it out to people and they were reading them. It was only at one point where they said, you know what, these are inappropriate jokes, Tim, you shouldn't be sending this out. We can get in trouble. And, and you have to do that not on, on, on the company emails, but people can do it personally because they had this atmosphere of creating this fun atmosphere, you know, like that sorority fraternity like um, atmosphere. But uh, but that just killed it. Right. So no one really wanted to do it, per, you know, uh, via personal email. And then I found out, again, no complaints towards me of my jokes or my comments. But guess what? When it came time for them to consider me for a manager position, they said, hey, Tim, listen, you make a lot of jokes and some of them are inappropriate. And even though no one has actually accused you of anything or you made people feel uncomfortable, guess what? We're terrified as a leadership team that we would put you in a manager position that you might say something that might offend somebody. And so that was my wake up call. And I'm like, wow, guess what? The jokes that you make, whether in work or outside of work, create a perception of you and that can actually impact whether you get promoted or not. And I had to really come correct. And I really basically transformed. I actually went to the opposite extreme. I became super professional in my office environment to the point that I would not make any jokes and I was miserable. And it was only later that I came back towards the middle where I could kind of relax and say, hey, you know what? Um, I, can, I can be playful. I can make the jokes light, you know, and I have to know who I can actually joke with, whether it's at work or outside of work. And, and so all of you, my invitation is to be very, very careful. Anybody right now could be really upset, could be easily offended by what you're saying and get you written up, even though that wasn't your intention, even though you have love in your heart, even though if it was just a joke, guess what? It, 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 it could actually get you in trouble, you know? Yeah, uh, uh, Shania, knowing to, who to joke what, with is so important. And guess what? I'll even tell you this story. My brother, who's now a very successful FedEx, you know, sales representative, manages million dollar accounts and things like that. Um, he was telling me when he was working at like Rite Aid, used to be called Thrifties back then. Uh, and they used to serve ice cream and he would just was a cashier. He actually had a coworker, a female coworker that he was really fun and playful with. And one time, 
whatever it was, he made a joke no different than all the other times that he had been joking with her. And it was that moment that a switch came on and she found it completely inappropriate. Complained to the manager. The manager told him, hey, you know what? You offended this person. Stop it. And it's like, wait a minute. I don't understand. I was teasing this person perfectly fine before. And that now something happens and now I can't joke around. The answer is yes. Why is this so important? It's because uh, people are unpredictable. People are emotional. People have different triggers that can get them upset. And so knowing what that is, you know, I can't say create a definite rule, never joke around with anybody because I, I love to joke around. But yes, be very, very careful who we, you joke with, have such a high level of trust that I like I won't even at my jobs now, I won't even use a curse word in a chat. I will, if I want to say the word ASS, I will put star SS, like, because I already assume that everybody's listening to me, everybody's monitoring and watching my text, watching my emails, that you just have to be so professional, you know, and, uh, and that's what you do. Yeah, like you said, read the room before making jokes. Again, I don't even want to read the room before I made jokes, make your jokes so soft and easy and light that 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 nobody can be offended, you know, <laughs> you know, nothing dirty, nothing inappropriate, because those were my mistakes. So again, that was me sharing my experiences. I would like to hear from the group. Feel free to raise your hand. What were some of the mistakes that you have seen at your job that uh, you experience and what you learn from that? Or maybe you actually identify with one of these. Who would like to share uh, what, what their experience was been? Shania, how about you? Yeah. Um, I identify with a few of those mistakes. One, um, the social butterfly. I do talk a lot with, with my employee, with my coworkers, and that is because I'm like a talkative person, and it, it's just weird for me to to work in silence sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I identify with. Um, and sometimes I realize it to the point where I'll do more than what's expected of me. And then because of that, I'll like try to double down on what I do because I know my manager doesn't really ask for it. So it's like, why am I overworking myself when I don't have to? So yeah, definitely yep. um, those two points. No, I'm so glad you do that. So let me address those two. The first point that you made which is about talking too much, being a social butterfly. I'm going to tell you, I don't want you to cut off and stop being who you are and being social, but what it's an invitation for you to be a little bit different with being social. There's one just saying hi to people, being very friendly, but not getting into lengthy conversations with anybody. Uh, in the morning saying, hey, I just wanted to say hello. Okay, that's it. You know, and if people want to get a long conversation, say, hey, you know what, let's connect later on in the day or during lunchtime. I'd love to hear all about it. So it's, it's allowing you to focus on getting jobs done, the most important stuff done in the morning, so that the reward for yourself would be to socialize after. That's just one little technique that you can do. And because I was a manager, I had to manage all these different people. I had people who were social butterflies and I, I, I was very careful not to like clip their wings. You know, I, I knew one, one team member who would spend half an hour to 45 minutes saying hello to everybody. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this person reminds me of me when I was younger. But as a manager, I would say, if I tell him to stop doing that, I'm just becoming authoritarian micromanager boss that's not actually working to his style. All I cared about was performance of what the expectation is. Now, if he asked me, how can I get promoted? How can I do more? I would say, yeah, maybe reduce the amount of time you spend or whatever it is. But, uh, you know, that is my recommendation for those people who like to talk a lot. In terms of your second point, which I thought was very valid about overworking yourself, I'm going to put a pin in that because we're going to talk about more about that because I did that too. And I'll share with you what that experience was. Okay, so let's keep going. So now let's talk about here are five skills that you need to develop in order to become 
a successful employee, aka manager. So I uh, was working at NSLS. The president and founder, there were two different people, you know, Gary and Chuck. They were great mentors and they say, Tim, you're you're awesome. You, we believe in you. You have so much potential. We want you to serve on the leadership team of this company. We want you to help us grow. But in order to do so, you're like a diamond in the rough. We need to give you some skills and some training and development, a kind of boot camp in order for you to take you to the next level. Okay. And so I said, you know what? I'm game. Let's do whatever we need to do. And so these were the five skills that they trained me on in order to be a successful leader within the company. And I showed an image of uh, the movie G.I. Jane, if any of you have seen it. It's a very, very good movie with Demi Moore, uh, where she had to get into the military and she had to work, especially being a woman. I highly recommend you see that film. But it was a serious boot camp. I had to work on time management productivity, prioritization, delegation, and management. And so I'll go into each one of those things a little bit more detail, okay? So the first thing was time management. They said, you know what, Tim, where is all your time going, right? You're staying very late. It seems like you're working hard, but we want to make sure that you're actually uh, using your time to your full ability. So can you track how much time you're using and what you're spending on every week on that? And I said, sure, absolutely. But guess what? I went to the extreme. I basically started to create a spreadsheet, uh, have notes and say, what am I doing every five minutes? <laughs> so I started counting every single thing that I was doing, answering emails, going to the bathroom. After this first day, I felt ashamed. Why? Because I realized that I drank so much water that I had gone to the bathroom five or six times. And I was terrified if they knew how many times I had to actually go to the bathroom. Right. So, again, I'm not telling all of you to actually break down your whole schedule into five minute increments. I'm actually showing you what I did in order to to really maximize that time. So then they, they would say, wow, OK, Tim, this is where you spend all this time. All right. Well, guess what? They didn't even have to tell me. I recognized how much time I was spending socializing, how much time I was taking for lunches, how much time I was answering emails and not working on different things. So again, if this is your, a challenge for you, I, I highly recommend that you do it. The next thing is once they started to see where all my time was going and I was now becoming uh, you know, uh, very good and efficient with my time and accomplishing a lot, they said, now that you're taking away all of your social wasting time. Let's make sure that the time that you are focused on work, that it is very productive. So for example, according to your timesheet, Tim, you spent, who knows, two hours working on this task. Why did you spend two hours working on that? This shouldn't have been two hours. You should have done this in like 10 or 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, so every time you're doing a task, you should ask yourself, how long should this task really actually take? And the analogy that I like to uh, show, and this is what most people do, is uh, if you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, right, you know, or, or you've seen the army, many times they'll say one of your duties is to uh, mop the floor or clean the floor. And in this time, they were kind of being punished to, to clean the whole floor with toothbrushes. But what if your boss asked you to actually wash the floor? Some people will actually do exactly this. They would say, well, let me see what tools I have. I have a toothbrush and I'll start scrubbing the floor like this. You know what? Why are you doing that? Why you should be able to do something much more efficiently, you know, get a mop. This could be cleaned in much, much quicker time. And, and, and the other thing that it was a very important insight where they basically said, Tim, I want we want to let you know that you're trying to do things that are perfect. But in reality, perfection is the enemy of the good. That was an important lesson to understand. It's not some jobs don't need to be perfect. It's good enough if you just got 80% of the job done and to just get it off your plate. And so you can actually be more productive and knowing that it's good enough. Like there's certain things you have to know when you have to be perfect on and when not to be perfect on. And I'll give you a perfect example. Like, let's say you were an entrepreneur and you're working for yourself and you have your own website. 
you know, some people are such perfectionists that they will spend weeks upon weeks of trying to perfect their website, right? Getting every word right, getting the FAQ. What I help train executives, CEOs, other people just say, just get the website up. What if there are grammar mistakes? Guess what? When you when you <laughs> launch the website and you see those mistakes, you fix them because in the end, it's never going to be perfect. Every time you look at a piece of writing that you've done, how many times can you read a paper over and over and over and over again and always find another correction? You're like, oh my goodness, how did I miss that? Well, that's the way it is in life. And so as to be a successful uh, leader, you have to be very productive. And so that's, that's an important lesson that I had to learn. The next thing was prioritization. So what did I mean by this? Everything, and this is what we talked about on the biggest challenge leaders face, everything that you do in your job should always be boiled down to these three priorities. Is it an immediate business need? Meaning, hey, this is what's expected of you. This is what you have promised your customers, et cetera. You know, you do it because it actually brings revenue to the company. That is an immediate business need. The second thing is a significant business enhancement, right? Like this could actually, you know, really make a difference. Uh, you know, it's not the most immediate thing, but it could be significant. And then the third thing would be nice to have. And hey, it's nice, but it won't really make much of a difference. And so what ended up happening is my mentors taught me that says, Tim, you have to divide all your tasks in these three things. And the biggest example that I can really give is, let's say you're on a sales team and you want to increase sales. An immediate business need might be, are you making the phone calls, calling people, uh, companies, or sending out emails to more people so that you can get business? That's an immediate business need. A significant business enhancement might be, let's make a, a video so that instead of people reading all these emails, they could actually learn about this product or service so it'd be quicker and fun, and, and maybe we can get more eyeballs, we can post it on social media. Or maybe the third thing, it's, is it a nice-to-have item? Well, what if you say, I have a sales flyer, I have a sales sheet, maybe I should uh, improve it. Maybe I should like edit it. Well, guess what? You already have a sales sheet. So what if you make it shorter? You know, it's still the same sheet. It's not, it's a nice to have. It's not going to make that much of a difference. So one of the things that my mentors taught me is that, okay, when it comes to your priorities, focus on the most important things. So when you look at your day, out of all the different tasks, which one is the most important? And guess what? Usually the task that's the most important is the one that you least want to do. <laughs> it's the one you want to postpone. And so uh, there was a famous book called, uh, you know, uh, by, by uh, Brian Tracy, the famous author and motivational speaker and business expert. And he, it was called Eat the Frog, or I like to call it Swallow the Frog, meaning before you even start your day, do the most disgusting thing. Like if you had to eat a frog, swallow it first, even though you'd want to avoid it and do that, do that first so that you can be more productive. And I think that has what allowed me to be very successful in all the different activities and things that I've done. I've had people comment, wow, Tim, how come you get so much accomplished? And it's like, because I prioritize and I focus on doing what the most important things are, right? And I do that first before anything else. And so what was so funny is I would actually uh, write a list of all the different things that I had to do. And every week I would, you know, uh, show it to my mentors and managers. And they said, Tim, how come you didn't work on this? And I'm like, well, it's because I was answering email. I was doing this and this came up. And then they said, okay, Tim, I'm going to tell you right now, you see this list, it is organized on priorities. Okay. And what I want you to do is I don't you dare, you know, like this meme says, don't you dare work on the second thing until you have done the first thing. And I have to tell you all, it was one of the most difficult tasks I've ever experienced. How is it that you have people coming at you needing something? And you're like, no, 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 no. I cannot work on this, which is what I really want to do right now until I actually do this thing first. And overcoming that, breaking that habit. It was, it was almost like trying to, I'm right-handed to write with your left hand. But the moment that I had to break through that, guess what? 
a whole new world could open up. So now I could actually write with both hands. It is just the analogy. So again, if you can do that, excellent. And yes, agreed, Susan, procrastination is the enemy. And, and we all do it because it's natural in us to do the most easy thing first, but don't do the easiest thing. Do the most important, the, uh, the, the highest priority. And guess what? This concept is so simple, so easy to understand, but people write books on them. There's a famous book that I haven't read, but I know about called Essentialism, right? Uh, there's another a famous sales book called The One Thing. All of these things are different concepts of saying, guess what? You're doing so much other stuff. Stop it. Just focus on the number one priority and do it well. And the analogy would be, imagine people trying to chop down trees. If you had a big ax and you had to chop out a bunch of trees, what happens if you chop on this tree, chop on this tree, chop on this tree, and it'd be hours before you even chopped anything down. However, if you actually stayed at one tree and chopped it and kept chopping it until it fell over, then you moved on to the next tree and kept chopping it down until you might have actually chopped down three trees when other people are still trying to chop 50 trees down. So I, I hope that you really get this idea because it's so important in order for you to be a successful manager and leader and be promoted. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is delegation. So if you've ever seen the TV show Parks and Recreations, Leslie Nope is this famous character, uh, and she loves to be a leader, but she loves to do everything. And she hates having to have other people do it because she loves it so much. She's kind of like a workaholic, you know? Uh, some people come, are like that, but they have a lot of fears, to actually delegating tasks. And I always would ask a crowd of people, why do you, uh, why are you afraid of delegating? And you'll hear the same responses over and over again. Uh, you know, I, I don't delegate, you know why? Because I can do it faster than everybody else. Or number two, it's I do delegate, but people are unreliable and that they never end up doing it. So I have to do it anyway. So I might as well do it myself. Or they might say, you know what, I have to do it because that's the only way I know that it will actually be done the right way, because some people will do it and they'll do it, you know, a terrible job. And I don't want that. I have high standards. So these are all logical reasons on why people should uh, or why people avoid delegating. But guess what happens if you don't delegate? You end up looking like this, <laughs> you know, you end up uh, burning the candlestick at both ends, you overwork yourself, you lose sleep, you get angry, you say things that you don't mean to say, you have a shorter temper, a shorter fuse, you know, and you're angry, upset, you're, you're spiking cortisol, you're going to impact your health. It's just all these other negative reasons. And there's even more. What happens if you actually get sick and you have to be in bed or break your arm or something like that, and you can't work, well, guess what? You have, uh, you've been doing everything that the, now the whole organization suffers. The whole company suffers because the person that they've been relying upon to do everything is not available because you didn't empower people. You didn't teach people how to do these things. So that's why it's so important that you learn how to delegate. So I'm going to actually teach you all right now how to delegate. So uh, where did I learn how to delegate was from the famous book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People from Stephen Covey. And in the book, there's a famous story called Green and Clean, where he's trying to teach, uh, Stephen Covey's trying to teach his son to actually uh, mow the grass and keep and maintain the grass. It's a, it's a worthwhile read if you've ever read it. But what I did is I really tried to take that story, take those concepts, and then simplify them into the most key steps. And this is what I pulled out, that there's five steps to delegate something. You actually have to give people the results, the guidelines, the resources, accountability, and consequences whenever you're going to uh, delegate something. And it's hard to remember all those things, so I created a mnemonic device to help each and every one of you remember how to delegate. It's called Rappers Give Rhymes, Attitude, and Color. Okay, I know it's cheesy, but it's the only thing that I could think of that started with all those letters. And so what you're going to do is uh, do all these things so that you know that you've delegated effectively. So let me actually go over what these might be. 
So first of all, results. This is uh, what this means is give a clear understanding of what needs to be done. And, and just in this example, uh, I, I just assumed that there's an organization, there's somebody that needs to do a room reservation. And so you're now delegating this to somebody else to say, hey, guess what? Can you please reserve the room because we need it for the next Friday in order to have our event, right? That's what most people would do. They would just tell them the result of what they need. But most people stop there. But I want to teach all of you, that's not really delegating. That's telling people or asking people what to do, but you need to give everything else, all the five steps of delegation in order to make sure that it gets done, done correctly and done on time. So after the results, you're very clear on what you need to do. You need to give them the guidelines, okay? These are all the restrictions that they need in order to do the job well. So one of the things that you have to be very careful of is a lot of times people give so many guidelines that they end up micromanaging people and you want to avoid that. If it's so complicated and so detailed oriented with all these different guidelines, people are not going to want to do it or and, and it's going to be very frustrating. So it just what's the bare minimum of guidelines you need? So in this example, you would say, okay, we're trying to reserve a room of, you know, for Saturday evening. And we, it's for 100 people, again, because sometimes maybe they give a, a room that's reserve a room that's too small. You have to be specific. All right, what do you actually need in order to get this done? Okay, well, we need a laptop. We need an LCD projector. We need a screen. These are all the things that we need in order for it to be a successful room reservation. Then the third thing, wrappers give rhymes, results, guidelines, resources, Okay, what are the different things that we could provide them to help them get this job done? It could be people, it could be money, right? It could be technical, like this is how you do it. It could be organizational. So this, in this example, you would say, okay, you need to contact Mrs. Hall, right? Here's her contact information. She's the one that can reserve rooms. You're going to have to then speak with IT department and reserve them to get the equipment. Here is the uh, all the list of all the items that we need. Okay, and here's some money, uh, or here's your bank account code in order for them to have a deposit on reserving those materials. So, do you see by you putting these things in chronological order? you will avoid the mistake of delegating something and say, oh, I forgot to include that or I forgot to mention that or I just assumed that they would know how to do that. No, you can't always make that assumption. And then the uh, next one is accountability. Results, guideline, resources, accountability. As rappers give rhymes attitude, A, for accountability. Accountability is the standards of performance. So you set a specific time for evaluation. <laughs> I call this to making sure that people don't screw up. So if you know that the event's on Saturday and you wanna make sure that they reserve the room, you want to check in and set a date, you know, probably that Wednesday to say, hey, I wanna make sure that we go over on Wednesday that you've reserved the room and you show me all the details that, that it's reserved and taken care of, okay? And, and at that point, you're gonna evaluate. Why do you do that? is because, well, what if Wednesday morning you get a text message? I'm so sorry. My, my dog got sick. I have to go to the emergency vet hospital. And so now you don't, oh, I didn't have a chance to reserve the room reservation. You have now put in time and you built in a buffer so that you can make sure that you get that job done. And you could do it last minute if you have to, or they did it but guess what? They did it incorrectly. They reserved the wrong room. They thought it was going to be 100, but it was like 90. And so it's like, maybe can we get a bigger room, et cetera, et cetera. That's why you do that. And then the last thing is rappers give rhymes, attitude, and color. Consequences for C. Uh, what will result either good or bad after the evaluation? Meaning, why is it so important uh, that we get this job done? Now, this this when you think of the word consequences, you usually think of something bad, but no, it could actually be good. All right. So in this example, if we reserve the room by Friday, we can make sure that we can have the best room before all the other clubs or organizations take it up. So those are the steps to delegation. So uh, now if I were to ask you to delegate something, 
uh, you know, hey, can you wash my socks? Or, you know, choosing a very silly example, you might say, okay, yeah, I'll do your socks. Okay, here are the socks, you know, um, and you just might make all the assumptions that they have a washer, they have access, they, they have soap. But if you actually follow the, these uh, guidelines as stewardship delegation, you'll say, okay, Tim taught us, all right, I need to give the five steps of delegation results. Okay. What do I really want? Okay. My socks, I need them clean, white, no stains, smelling good. All right. That's what I want. <laughs> because guess what? If you say I want them clean, you know, they could maybe just spray Lysol on them, give them back to you. Like, okay, they're clean. They've been disaffected. Like, no, I wanted the stains out. You know, again, you have to be very specific with the results guidelines, right? <laughs> Sometimes people are like, I'll just, you know, uh, dip the socks in white paint. <laughs> you know, you have no idea. Hey, use hot water, uh, don't use cold water, you know, uh, whatever it may be in terms of washing the socks. Don't use too much bleach, you know, things that you worry about so that they may not do it correctly. Resources, here's the money to go to the laundromat. Do you have soap? Do you have, uh, you know, sheets for the dryer? Again, you start thinking about all the things that they need in order to get the job done. Accountability, I need it by next Saturday. So check with them by Wednesday. Can you make sure that it's done? Can we check in by that time? Great. And the consequence is, I, hey, if I don't get my socks done, uh, you know what, I will have a concert and I won't be able to have any, you know, socks and it will look unprofessional. I don't know. You can make it up. But do you see how something as simple as getting somebody to clean your socks that everybody would say, yeah, everybody knows how to do that. But no, not everybody knows how to do that. Uh, and so follow those five steps. Now, uh, one of the things as you all practice and become better at delegation. Because for me, when I first learned it, there's a difference between knowing how to delegate and actually delegating. This is what I, I would recommend for you to start out early. Before you actually delegate somebody in a meeting, on your own, individually, write out these five steps and write out almost as if you had to delegate somebody to something via email, type it all up. What is the results that I want? What are the guidelines and restrictions do I want to give them? What are the resources? When do I want to hold them accountable? What would be the consequences? So that you flush all those five things out so that when you actually meet up with them, you now have that all prepared and you can actually have a conversation with that individual. And then they're going to be impressed like, oh my goodness, Tim. Like, thank you so much. And they're going to do that job. And you're going to say, this is perfect. And they're going to thank you because you were so clear with what you wanted to do. Now, first, I've worked for a lot of managers <laughs> throughout my years. Some were good, some were bad, and some were terrible. <laughs> and uh, I use this image of there's a, a movie called Bad Teacher. Uh, and uh, this famous actress whose name escapes me right now, maybe you guys will remind me in the chat. Uh, Cameron Diaz, that's what it was. Cameron Diaz play, plays the bad teacher. And uh, what I want to share with you is that you are all likely going to have terrible managers. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to break the news to you. Why is because a lot of people don't get trained in these things. Again, all of you being part of elective society have an advantage to learn these things now, um, but not everybody has so. I, I've had one managers that I've uh, have asked me to do stuff. And when I asked them questions, they said, no, no, you figure it out because guess what? They wanted me to do it. And so that if I failed, they could actually correct me and show me everything that I did wrong. Can you believe that? Again, some people get off on psychologically messing with people. Okay. I'm not saying that you're going to have bosses like that, but I've had them. So, you know, uh, be careful, beware. So when you are uh, having a boss or a manager and they ask you to do a task, what if they haven't given uh, uh, you all these five guidelines? Well, guess what? You manage up, meaning, hey, boss, I really appreciate you uh, giving me this task. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it to my best of my ability. Can I ask you some questions to make sure that it's done the best way? You have a minute? Now, some managers are like, no, just do it. I'm too busy. You know what? 
you could say, you know what, I'll circle back at you at a later time. Maybe they're too overwhelmed and stressed and can't answer all those questions. But ask them, hey, what guidelines? Uh, is there anything that results? Is there anything that you want me to do uh, in terms of guidelines like that you would want me to avoid or things that to make sure that I don't make those mistakes? Um, hey, is there any resources that I need to get this job done? Is there any money that I need? Any in, any materials? Any people I need to contact? Uh, contact information? Hey, I know that you want me to do this next Wednesday. Hey, I'm going to work on it now and this week, but can I check in with you on Monday to make sure that I'm doing it right and I'm on the right track before I do all this work and it's not the way that you want it? Sure, sure, fine. And uh, and, and that's and that's it, you know? Hey, uh, I don't think you would ask the question, what happens if I don't <laughs> get this job done? You know, that might be a terrible question to ask, but uh, it's a nice question to say, hey, well, what's what are the positive benefits of me doing this task? <laughs> no, you don't even forget the last one. You don't need to ask about consequences. Uh, you, uh, if it's really important, you might be curious enough to say, "Hey, why is this so important?" Task just so that I know I want to do the job to the best of my ability. Okay. Anybody have any questions about uh, delegation and how to handle this? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I hope that it's helpful. Uh, I'll, I'll just take a minute. Uh, let me just check on the group, uh, Susan. Uh, just from your experience, I don't know if you have a chance to unmute. Have you ever had bad managers or people that did a terrible job at delegation? I just want you to see whether this actually resonates with you. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> what Most happened? Of my managers, oh my God. They would, you know, they would put me in front of something and say, do it without really showing me how to do it. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, and this is the case with other different people. So I hope that now with these five things uh, that you will now be more empowered to ask these questions. Hey, what is the result that you want? Are there any guidelines for me? Are there any resources I need? Hey, can I check in with you so that uh, uh, I make sure that I'm doing the right way? Just those four questions you can um, sidestep and, and manage up, meaning, hey, this is what your manager was supposed to say and do, but they mm -hmm. didn't. So it's now on you to manage up from them to make sure that you ask those questions to get it all done. So Susan, I really appreciate you sharing that. All right, let's keep going. So now you're a manager. <laughs> you've done all this work. You've mastered these habits. You've mastered your time, your prioritization, productivity, delegation, all the other stuff. You're like, you're so awesome. You should be put as a manager. Well, I think it's important that if you're trying to get promoted to be a manager or manage people, again, promotions can happen just higher pay, but uh, you promotions can also be higher levels of position where you have to have responsibility of seeing other people. I don't know. It may be different in different companies or organizations, but if you're going to be a manager, these are all the things that you need to do in order to, in my opinion, be a successful manager. It starts off with the first thing. The most important thing that a manager can do is set expectations, meaning how do I know what I need to do if I'm doing a good job or not? <laughs> it's the job of the manager to actually show you and explain to you, hey, Tim, this is what you need to do in order for me to say that you're doing an excellent job. And it's almost the opposite of what we do in school. It's like, here's all the information, and then we're going to give you a test on it and how much you can remember. That's what um, you know, you're going to be evaluated on, right? That's not clear because you don't know what's going to be on the test. You don't know what stuff's more important. In the job environment, it's like, here is the test. Here are all my expectations. At the end, if you get these answers to all these questions, you're doing a fantastic job. That's what you want as a manager. Okay. The next thing that you do as a manager is you actually have accountability meetings. You have to actually meet with your team members and you have to check in on with them. There are some managers that I've spoken to or employees when I was interviewing. I said, How often did you meet with your manager? When did you have evaluations? They said, I never met with my manager. They were always too busy. You know, I, I, uh, we wouldn't even have uh, meetings. We, they, would, they would only come talk to me to tell me if there was something that I was doing wrong. Wow, that is a big problem. You know, that is not, in my opinion, run very well. You need to have accountability meetings. Why? Is because there's so much that needs to be covered in your meetings. 
One is when you actually are having a meeting and say, hey, everybody, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Some people say, okay, I sent an email out. All employees have to do X, Y, and Z. Well, guess what? What if the employees don't like that? What if they have concerns? What if they, they're worried about stuff? Those meetings are those opportunities for you to explain why this is so important, for you to have buy-in and say, tell me what your concerns are. Let's talk about them, right? Because if those are concerns are really legit and they're not just fears, maybe I need to, as a manager, go tell my boss, hey, you know what? Uh, Henry told us about this. This is a really good point. We, we need to answer these concerns because this could happen. That's a good communication between manager employees. The other times is venting. Many times things can be very frustrating. And you know what? Uh, I'm going to put a little, next time, put a little asterisk about this venting because sometimes you'll have different bosses where they don't want to hear you vent. They don't want to hear you complain um, because it's like they, what you end up doing, just complaining about you know, coworkers to other coworkers or complaining about bosses. A good boss allows their team members to vent because they want to hear. I want to know what's going on. I don't need to know why you're frustrated because either one, you just need to have somebody listen to you or two, it needs to be resolved. Now, one of the things that I had a problem being as a manager is when people vented, I was always like, how do we fix this problem? And guess what? I realized, again, this is whether this is in relationships or whatever it is, sometimes people need a vent. And I was always trying to solve problems when they didn't really want me to solve problems. They just wanted me to listen. So sometimes with my team members, I'm like, is this venting? Because I'll just listen. I, you know, I don't need to solve problems. And I would have them hold out the peace sign like V for venting. You're like, oh, I'm just venting. I'm like, oh, okay, say whatever you want. And I would just listen. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Oh, man. Oh, wow. You know, at least they're venting because they know how to do their job. So uh, at least I can create an environment, a safe space for that to happen. Then it's an opportunity for us to mentor them, to train them. I can give uh, also feedback to senior management of what's going on in that person. Hey, maybe they want to be promoted. Maybe they're really doing a good, good job at this. And so having a good pulse on what, what's going on with your people is so important. The third thing that, so those are all the, the stuff that's important when you have meetings with your team members. The third thing that's a job of a good uh, manager is to have evaluations. They need to know, hey, here's the numerical value based on what you've done. Did you actually hit your metrics? Did you do what you're supposed to do? Great. Then it's an opportunity for you to actually show them how they can improve their performance. And a job of a manager is to hire people and fire people, especially if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then the last thing, which is very difficult for good managers to do, is they actually have to predict whether or not this person is going to succeed in their job. Meaning, hey, we all have a certain sales goal. We all have to achieve a certain key metric or thing. Is the team on track to do what they need to do? Now, here's the problem. Most employees, most team members want to tell their bosses because of their own egos, yeah, everything is good, everything's fine. Or sometimes out of their own egos, oh, I'm awesome, I'm gonna blow it out of the water. And then the boss will say, oh, wow, they're telling me they're gonna do really well. And these person says they're fine. They're gonna go up to management and say, We're, our team's doing great. But then as you get closer and closer to the deadline, Guess what starts happening? Uh-oh, this person's not doing as well as they thought. Oh my goodness, we're having red flags. And then you have to go back to your boss and say, you know how I was telling you all these metrics that we were going to hit? It, you know, there's so many fires. Uh, I don't know if we're going to hit their metrics. What? You're the manager. You're supposed to tell me that things are going <laughs> uh, well. I don't want to hear last minute that we're all going, everything's going to hell in a handbag. So again, this is a skill as a manager to basically say, okay, what's realistic? What is the history? Uh, what are we likely to do? D dive into the details to get accurate pictures. Okay, uh, you know, under promise and then over deliver is, is, the, is the good motto to follow. So I re remember that my team members would tell me, oh, I'm gonna do excellent. And I'm like, you know what? I don't think that they're going to hit that goal. So better to tell my boss a lower number and then we hit that or we exceed it. So again, we're going to talk about that concept very uh, more. So let's talk about the biggest myth right now that I have been told that you have been told to get ahead or get promoted. 
if you work very hard, you will be rewarded and promoted for your work, right? Just work to the best of your ability, work to the bone, you know, over deliver all this other kind of stuff, work, 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 and you're going to get promoted. And uh, Shania, this is something that we were talking about, remember, in the beginning of the presentation that I promised to um, uh, bring up. Well, this, I'm sorry to say, in my opinion, is completely false. And I'll give you several examples of this. One, <laughs> you know, from the TV show, The Office, if you've ever seen Dwight Schrute, uh, he's a funny character. But guess what? He's one of the hardest working salesperson in that company, uh, Duffin uh, Paper, whatever the name of, uh, uh, of that company was, right? He never got promoted. Why? He was hardworking. He hit his goals because if you're doing your job, doing your job very well, doesn't necessarily mean that you get promoted. You actually might just be uh, happy because the manager says this person's solid and they're doing their job and they're doing the job well, and that's it. And I'm very happy with it. You know, uh, I've hit my goals. And because maybe there are other skills that you're missing that you need in order to be uh, promoted. And I'm going to give you a perfect example for this because I think it's a very important story to, to illustrate. So I was working to the bone. Uh, I was working for NSLS. I was the broadcast producer. So I would have to get all these different speakers and celebrities to come speak uh, to all these different colleges. I would actually have to run the broadcast, work with schools to coordinate all the logistics. While I was doing that, I was also leading leadership conferences, training interns to start chapters. I was doing like three different jobs. And I would just like, come on, bring it on. I can do it. I can do it. I can work so hard and I'm doing all this other stuff. And guess what happened? I was working and working and working and working. And they're like, good job, Dim. You're doing a good job. And I got, I was working so hard that I realized that I was getting burnt out. And at one point I said to my manager, you know what, I'm doing all this work and I just don't feel like I'm getting appreciated, you know? And they said, oh, you know, no, we really do appreciate you. Guess what happened? The next month I was given employee of the month. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've been busting my butt for three or four months and I didn't get employment month. And so it was only when I said something that, hey, I want to feel appreciated that that's when you decide to give me employment in month. Aha, uh -huh. that was a very, very important learning lesson to me is that, you know what? You can work as hard as you, you have to be your own advocate. And guess what would happen? After I left that position and I stepped down, I got promoted to do something else. The people that would actually take over my position, they realized that it was too much work and they had to hire two people to do my job. So they separated the jobs. So guess what? Companies, jobs want you to perform till the maximum amount that you say, I'm sorry, I can't do anymore. And they say, okay, got it. That's the limit that we can actually have with this individual. But guess who decides how much work that they can do? You decide how much work that you can do. And so going back to the principle, it's always better to under promise over deliver. I was always trying to say, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do more just so that I could be recognized, get, it was feeding my own ego. I wanted to show them that I was somebody important, but it was only through my career and experience that I realized that that's not the case. So here's what I really discovered. It's not about, uh, you know, overworking yourself. If you want to actually get promoted, you need to do what your manager and your leadership team expects of you by under promising and over delivering. Meaning, don't go in there and say, you know what? Hey, team, we're going to blow the sales out of this quarter. We're going to do an amazing job. All you basically do is you, you pump the brakes. You basically say, okay, you know what? We're going to work very hard. We're going to do our best of our ability to hit the goal, right? And as you are tracking the goal, what if you can actually know that you're doing well? And you know what? Maybe we could be exceeding it. You don't tell them right away, right? You know, as you get closer and closer, then once you start to feel much more comfortable and confident, then you say, 
boom, guess what? I'm happy to announce we tremendously exceeded our goal. I've been telling you for the last time that we're going to only get to start five chapters. We're starting 10 chapters. Like, oh my goodness, this whole time you're telling me starting five, now you're starting 10. What did you do? You underpromised and then you over delivered. So guess what you, you're doing for them? They are now recognizing you as somebody who's a high achiever, high performer. It would have been worse if you said, you know what? We're going to do 10 chapters. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. And guess what? This happened, this happened, this happened. And, and the goal was five. And now you only got eight. Well, guess what? You've been telling the management that you've been going to do 10, 10, 10 all the time. And now you do only eight. Guess what they're going to say? You didn't hit what you said you were going to do. You didn't hit your goal, right? Even though that goal was here, you said you were going to do here. And so again, these are very important distinctions that I want you to learn from my own personal experience that, that I wish somebody would have told me because then I wouldn't have relied on my ego. So again, I know I've been talking a lot. I'd like to get some of your thoughts on, on what you're thinking. Naisha, I haven't heard from you yet. If you have a chance to unmute yourself, what are your thoughts based on everything that I'm sharing with you right now? Naisha, do you have a chance to unmute? Okay, maybe you might not be available. All right, what about you, Shania? If you can unmute, what are your thoughts based on everything I shared? Because I know that you brought this uh, comment up before about overworking yourself. Shania, are you there? Okay, maybe Shania might not be available. Susan, I'll give you the last word, all right, before we move on to the next uh, moment. What are your thoughts based on everything I'm sharing? I do that a lot. I promise the world and I deliver ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's a new phrase. Yeah. You promise the world, deliver ice cream. No, so do you, uh, are you of the person that ties to promise the world and then sometimes get frustrated that you don't deliver? Or do you yes. under promise? Oh, okay, why? Because you want to make people happy. You want to please people, right? Right, I'm a people pleaser to, to a fault sometimes. Exactly. So this message that I'm trying to share with you is for you. You don't be the people pleaser. You come off humble. Hey, this is the goal. I'll do my best to hit that goal. That's it. No more, no less. You don't talk up a big game. You know, you don't, you know, uh, there's a difference if you say I have experience, you know, doing well and exceeding goals, but you're not letting people know that you're going to, uh, you have the goal. You have it internally that you're going to exceed that but you don't communicate that verbally, right? You just say, right. I'm going to do my best to hit that goal. And then what you do is you keep promising that and then boom, you over deliver. Hey, I know that you wanted that by Wednesday and I told you I was going to get it Wednesday. Here it is. I'm giving it to you Monday, you know, several days earlier. Wow, yeah. you told me you were going to give me a Wednesday. Now you're giving me Monday. Wow, what a great worker you are. That You exceeded my expectations. So right. again, this is, is the secret sauce and because we're dealing with people and managers, uh, you know, who are making a judgments on you, whether to promote you or not, you know, you want them to always walk away with this idea that, uh, that you uh, under promise and over deliver. And so that's the reputation you build. Okay, cool. And I always love using this analogy with expectations equals frustration. Uh, and we can apply this to our own personal life and relationships. What if you expect that you're going to meet that special somebody and you're going to go walk on the beach and it's going to be so romantic. And then in the reality is the, that that partner's playing video games, ignoring you, you're going to be really upset, but it'd be much different if you actually were real up the front. Hey, if you want a relationship with me, I love to play video games. I play video games all week. You know, there's this time <laughs> that I like to play video games and then we can have any time afterwards and like, let that let be real. But guess what? How much would it make a difference if, you know, you know what, today I'm not going to play video games. I'm going to dedicate all this time to you. Okay. You're like, whoa, you now exceeded my expectations. You basically said that you put all this stuff on hold just for me again it's expectations reality always lower the expectations uh under promise and over deliver and this can work in relationships as well okay so let's talk about getting that raise okay let's get that money so there are five steps to get a raise and it starts with 
guess what? Even during the job interview, you're going to ask questions about races. <laughs> They're not going to be maybe so bold and in your face, but I'm going to share with you what those questions are. Then when you first meeting with your manager, there's certain things that you need to say, certain things you need to do when you're having meetings, ongoing meetings, you're hired. Uh, with your manager during the evaluation at the end of the quarter, end of this end of mid year or the end of the year, and what you need to do and say when you have to ask for the promotion. So those are those are all uh, different things. So now let's go into each one of these in detail. So the first, let's say you're applying for a job. Okay, here are the questions that you should ask them. What is the growth opportunity within this organization? What is the hierarchy? Because that will give you an insight if you're applying for a coordinator position, right? Well, what's above that? Senior coordinator? What's above that? You know, the director? Like, you need to know what that org chart looks like so that you can understand that organization. The next question is, what's the average amount of time does it take for a person to get promoted from a coordinator to a senior position or to the director? And you'll start to notice that people start to get really <laughs> nervous about answering that question. Well, it's different for different people, but you're like, just give me an average. And asking that question, oh, well, we've had people get promoted after a year or two years. You're like, okay, I just understand. Uh, but some organizations is like, hey, you know what? It takes about five years before you actually get into a senior position. Well, at least you know going in what is the kind of expectation and what you're really working with, right? Uh, and a great other question to ask is, how are people rewarded if they do an excellent job or exceed expectations in their role? Then you can have an idea of a company of how they reward their people. And there's a story that I love to share, and it's a story of my sister-in-law, and she, I'm not going to mention the place that she was working for, but she was a psychotherapist and working for a nonprofit uh, who just did uh, psychological counseling for a group of people, and she was being, like we talked about before, being worked to the bone. There was a case of, you know, I guess they had a caseload of 35 people and who knows, some people were, were, were moved, left the organization. So she was trying to prove herself, take on more. So she was like managing 40 cases instead of the 30 uh, for 35. Again, I'm, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but you get the idea. So at one point, she's burning both ends of the candlestick, you know, trying to work so hard, prove herself, do well, get promoted, all that other stuff. So she's like, I'm not making a lot of money and I'm working so hard. And so I said, well, why don't you go up to your manager and say, hey, manager, I like to ask you a question. What if I could actually take on additional work and take on additional caseloads? Could I get make more money for doing that because I'd be more productive. So she's like, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> so guess what she did? She went up to the manager and had that exact conversation. Do you know what that manager did? She laughed. Oh my God, that's so ridiculous. No, sorry. It doesn't work like that here. You just have to do whatever you're assigned. You, you do the work. Guess what? That was an insight. This place does not reward people based on their effort and work. Guess what ended up happening? That company ended up having a bad reputation. A lot of other employees were very unhappy and people left for other jobs that paid more money. Okay. That writing could have been on the wall. Uh, again, these are the different things that you need to ask whether you have to, uh, whether you choose to actually work for a company or not. Now, it could be different in different places. If you're working in the nonprofit, in the business world, whatever it may be, some positions that say, you know what, in order for you to get paid more or get exceeded, you have to be a certain years, and then you come into this bracket or have this many years of experiences. That's fine. Just know the type of company you're working for, and then know what the expectations are. That's all these questions are. They're really just expectations. So you're hired. Woohoo! You're working for the company. You're having your first meeting with your manager. Hey, manager, nice to meet you. Let's. I know that we had an interview. What do you talk about in that first meeting? Well, I'm going to tell you what I talked about 
you know, I like to think of myself as a good manager because I managed all these different people, 600 interns managing them, 40 different employees. So this is what I would do. Okay. Question number one, <clears throat> as a manager, I want to get to know my employee. I need to know everything about you. And if I don't have time to get to know everything about you, I need to know at least why. What is important to you? What motivates you? Why do you do the things you do? Why do you want to succeed? Some people, hey, I'm here. I just want to make money. Uh, you know what? Whatever I can do that can make more money. All right, I, I get it. That's what's really important to you. You know, different strokes for different folks. The next question that I would ask is, what are your expectations of me? Now, most people would say, well, isn't my job as a manager to tell them what my expectations are of them? <laughs> yes, it is. But I think it's also important to actually have clear expectations because sometimes people come into jobs thinking, hey, my manager is supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Now, whenever I always ask that question to my employees, guess what? They always said the same thing. <clears throat> they said, well, hey, Tim, well, I expect you to answer questions if I don't have them or be available and, you know, and, and help me understand and help me know what I need to do. And so guess what? I started to use that as an opportunity for them to learn about me. Hey, guess what? Here are my strengths. Here are my weaknesses. You know, uh, uh, if you really want to get a hold of me, G-chat me, uh, send me a text because uh, don't send me an urgent email and expect me to answer it right away because you know what? I'm already focused on my other priorities. So again, I'm teaching them how to best work with three and my expectations so that they don't say, oh my God, I send an email to my boss. He never answers. And I, it's urgent. And I wrote on the subject heading urgent. Well, I'm already setting clear expectations, how the best to work with me, how, how to communicate with me, et cetera. Then I want to teach them how to excel the job. I want to give them the answers to the test. This is what you need to do. And so when I talk about expectations, Remember when we went back to delegating, the more complicated, the more guidelines you give, the harder it is for people to remember. I said, there's only three things that you need to know. Here are my expectations of you. Number one, take 100% responsibility. Okay, if you screw up, a member screws up, you take ownership of that. That's it. Just take responsibility. You can work on proof. If you're trying to blame other people, it's not going to work. Number two, I need you to have open communication with me. I need you to be vulnerable with me, okay? I need you to tell me what's going on. What are your fears? What are your worries? What are your concerns? This is a safe space. Now, the reason why I put an asterisk and a disclaimer is because I would actually tell that to people and I would share with them that that's what I want. But I would also say this caveat. I said, listen, even though I want to create a safe space for you, I want you to let you know that if you tell me certain things, because this is my job, you have to be very careful with what you say to me. For example, if you say, Tim, I want to commit suicide. I want to slice my wrist. I can't just create a safe space and keep that quiet to myself. I have a responsibility and obligation. So I let my team members know that, hey, listen, even though you may like me or whatever, I'm still here for a job, okay? So, uh, you know, I want you to be vulnerable, but be very careful. You can't just tell me everything, right? Because, uh, you know, I don't want to have to lie on the stand or whatever it is, whatever may be happening, right? Um, and here's the other story that I always want to mention to everybody. I was very trusting of my managers. I always thought that my managers were looking out for my best interest and I'm sorry to say that not all managers are like that. Some managers want to have power, have prestige. Uh, some managers want to look good, and they look good by making you look bad and things like that. And people have egos and sensitivities. One time, there was a uh, something happening. I can't remember the whole details of the story, but I wanted to, I saw a coworker doing something that I thought that wasn't good for the company. Right. And I and I went to my boss and I said, hey, they're doing something. And I really think that that, you know, uh, they're doing this thing and that you should know about it because we should fix it. And what that that thing that I was recommending, I'm being kind of vague, but again, it's not a matter of the details. The whole point is that my manager got offended. She's like, why did that person do it to do that? They're not supposed to do that. That 
my manager ended up confronting my coworker, having an argument, you know, becoming defensive and et cetera. And I'm like, and then that coworker came back to me and they say, Tim, why did you tell me? Why did you, excuse me, why did you say that to your manager? And I'm like, well, I was just trying to help the company. She's like, if you have a problem, you come to me. You don't go to your manager. And so that was the moment that my naivete uh, was lost because I actually thought as an employee, we're supposed to look out for the best interest of the company and that my manager was going to look out my best interest. No, managers are people too. They can have egos. They can become defensive and everything like that. So again, I walked away with a lot of lessons. If I have a problem with a coworker, address it there before I come, you know, share it with the manager, you know, having to uh, navigate that is, is, is very, very important. So again, and be careful what you could be used can be used against other people. So have a lot of trust in your manager and know whether there is a person. I'll show you this one more story again, because I'm showing you what a good manager is because maybe you're not going to have those good managers, but if you all become in positions of manager positions, I want you to do these things that I've learned to do that actually help create trust. So number one is whenever they say, I have a complaint about this other person, right? Because I created a safe environment. I would say, hey, I understand you have a complaint about this person. Uh, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to talk to that person for you? Or, you know, can you talk to that person? And, and, and so they get nervous because there's the game of the telephone game. Well, what if you don't communicate it the way that I could communicate it? What if they're going to upset? So I, I always try to encourage the employee to talk to that coworker or talk to some other director if they had a problem. But I'll say, how about this? If I'm going to speak to my boss, here's exactly what I would say. I would say, boss, this person said X, Y, and Z, and I just wanted to let you know. How does that sound, employee? Does that sound good if I say it exactly like that? And guess what that did? It relieved them. It's, they would say, oh, no, no, don't say that. Say it like this. I'm like, okay, so this is what you do to help create trust between your employees. You don't speak for them. You give them, you ease their fears and concerns and things like that. Again, I hope that you guys can all use that technique uh, as well when you're dealing with people. Uh, and then the last thing is tenacity, overcome obstacles. Uh, again, I always tell people, if you actually have a wall in front of you as an obstacle, some people become paralyzed. I basically tell people, listen, your job is to overcome that obstacle so that there's many ways to overcome an obstacle. If there's a wall, you can go over it. You can dig under and go underneath it. You can go to the left of it. You can right through it. You can start breaking a hole through that wall and crawl through. Whatever it is, your job is to overcome that obstacle. Now, if you don't know how, come to me. I will help you. We'll brainstorm. We'll come up with ideas. But that's the job. If you do those things, those three things, you're a rock star. Okay. And so once you actually have those accountability meetings with your manager, what do you do? The thing that I want you to all to remember is become BFFs with spreadsheets, <laughs> with uh, Google Docs or Google Spreadsheets or Excel. Why? Because guess what? Whenever you have your meeting, you're meeting with your manager, you want to actually talk about all your accomplishments, but you should be keeping track of all your accomplishments, everything that you're covering in your meeting. Don't depend upon your manager to remember all the good stuff that you're doing. Why? Is because once you have a spreadsheet of everything that you've done and accomplished uh, of all the things I'm going to talk about right now on a spreadsheet, when it comes time for you to write evaluation, guess what you're going to do? you're going to go back to that spreadsheet and you're going to say, these are all the awesome things that I have done. So that when you fill that out, they have, will have forgotten because it could be six months or a year later. And they're going to say, wow, look how great this person is. Again, these are these tricks. And sometimes managers take good notes on this, but I'm saying don't depend on your managers to do all that. In your meetings, you talk about learning moments, new commitments that you make. Listen, people are going to fail. If you made a mistake, you own up to it. Hey, listen. This happened, it was a mistake. I wanna apologize, take responsibility. And this is what I learned from it. And this is what I'll do differently next time. Okay, good, manager's happy. Now you don't have to tell everybody, 
all your manager, all the little mistakes that you need to do. It's only the big ones that you need to let them know. <laughs> Not all of them. Okay. Especially on your evaluation too. If it's minor stuff, don't bother sharing it. It's only the big stuff uh, because they have other things to worry about. Your meetings could also be talking about your struggles and challenges, uh, predictions under promise over deliver, make requests to make proposals, talk them out with your manager, ask them questions and venting if appropriate. All right. And then when it comes to evaluations, it's time for you to highlight your accomplishments. Like I said before, only share when you screw up big and what you learn from it and what your commitment to do different. Ask for what you want. If you say, hey, I want to uh, uh, get make more money. Uh, I'd like to get a promotion. I'd like to look for this position. I'm looking to take on more responsibility. Evaluations are a great time to do that. And you have to actually know your value and worth to the company and understanding leverage. What I mean by that is, let's say you're a coordinator for some company and you get paid this much. Well, you should be able to look on Glassdoor and find out, well, what are the different positions that other people are being paid in that same state or that same location for that same job, right? Because you need to know what value you really bring to a company and maybe you could be being paid much more. So that way uh, in negotiations, you can talk about that. Uh, I, I will tell you very briefly, um, the first time I got promoted, uh, they basically said, congratulations, Tim, you're being promoted. Here is some salary. We're going to increase your salary by $2,000. And I said, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative. Remember at that time, I was very agreeable. And uh, what ended up happening is because I was mentored by the president and founder, he said, hey, Tim, you know, you don't, I just want to let you know, I'm helping. I want to congratulate you, but I'm also kind of your mentor. And I just want to let you know, you don't always have to accept the offers or the promotions that you receive. Okay. You know, and, and he was kind of like saying, hint, hint, wink, wink, like, this is what I'm offering you. But I was just so grateful and thankful that he gave it to me that uh, I just said, no, no, I just really appreciate it. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Lesson learned. But he was actually sharing that you could, you could actually counter offer, or you could actually make a case. And then the next time I asked for promotion, they said, no, we don't have any money. We don't have any available. And then I ended up doing a proposal on showing after a season of like bringing so much business. And I actually showed them a chart of how much money I brought them and how much value. And then I'm asking for more money. And guess what ended up happening? They came back to me with a proposal. Tim, you are very great. You are you add a lot of value. Yes. Now let's look at how much we can give you. And they were much willing, much more willing to negotiate with me because I actually showed them how I added value. And then the other time that I got a promotion, I told them that I was applying, not that I was applying for different jobs. I said, I, I, I was doing some research. I would see other different jobs or positions that I could apply for. And what ended up happening is that I, uh, I knew of a, a company or individual at that place. And I knew that they would actually like me and would want to hire me. And then I ended up going to my manager and I would say, hey, manager, you know, I've been in conversations with this individual, this company, and they're willing to offer me a position. I haven't applied and I don't know if I'm going to take it, but what kind of compensation can you guys provide me? You know, and I use that as leverage to help actually get an increase in salary. And it ended up helping me in negotiating to get a little bit more money. So again, I really say all this to help prepare you because this is the final thing that I wanna share with you. It's a five minute video. I know it's uh, seven o'clock, so I apologize if we're going a little bit over. I'll, next time I'll make sure that I'll, I'll be much more conscious of the time. But uh, what I wanna share with you, this is a video from Barbara Corcoran. If you don't know who Barbara is, she uh, is on Shark Tank, right? And helps evaluate. And she gives a lot of great advice to people about getting jobs, races, and promotions. So I want to share uh, this video. We'll play it. I'll get your feedback. And then we'll close out with any questions, okay? So let's play it right now. Hold on. Do you really want to raise or this is a for example? We all want to make more money. Yes, of course. Um, and I so, can tell looking at you, you're underpaid. Because you would have got a much nicer shirt and trousers if you were making enough money. Wow. 
if you want to get a raise, and particularly if you're a woman who wants to get a raise, women don't ask for raises. I can tell you, I've employed thousands of women over my life. They do not ask for raises unless they absolutely must. And men ask all the time. And so what the smartest thing to do is, first of all, make an appointment to ask for a raise. Even if your expectation isn't that you're going to get it, at least ask for it, because that sets you up for the next meeting where you'll likely get it. And the smartest thing to do is to walk in with a list of your responsibilities when you started at the company, and then also the list of things you've taken on since you started. And simply make the boss aware that you have a lot more responsibility. You're delighted to take it on. Give me more, but I'd like to be compensated and to name a number you'd like. Most women, when they work up to the point where they'll ask for a raise, they won't give a number. I'd like to get a raise. Men will walk and say, I'd like to get a raise. I'd like it to be around 10, 15%. No qualms. So if you're a timid woman, I think the smart thing to do is ask, what would a man do? And walk in thinking like a man. If you don't get the raise, you have to ask what would merit a raise so that when you come back the next time, you can say, hey, this is what I've done. I'd like to get that raise. When someone has come to me and said they got another offer for a lot more money from somewhere else, and it's not followed up with so goodbye, they're looking for something for me. I never try to buy their loyalty because I haven't earned their loyalty, obviously, and they're on their way out the door. I'm not going to stop them with more money. They're already off my list. I can't wait for them to go out that door. And it's perfectly acceptable to go to your boss and say, you know, I'm a little surprised I got an offer for a lot more money, but I'm not taking it because I love this business. But I'm really wondering, could you level with me as to my future prospects here? That's a great opener. And it's not insulting and it's not threatening. And guess what? You'll get the best out of that boss. Very, very different than saying you want to pay up. The tone is entirely different. One, the boss wants to measure up. The other style, the boss wants to boot you out that door. <laughs> I think the piece you have to put in is I love, I, I got a great offer. I love working here and I plan to stay but it brings on the table my question, what do you think my prospects here in the future might be? That's pretty fair. If I were a boss, I would go out of my way to think of how I could push you ahead. If I valued it, and if my response instead was, well, I'm happy to hear about it, but you know, we pay you fairly and you have good responsibilities and we're pretty happy, so do what you want or something like that, I would know I'm not valued and I would take the other job because the one thing you must be in any position you are, male, female, whatever level you are, is you must be valued and appreciated to be promoted. It's a great way to go in and take a litmus test as to how you are valued in that boss's eyes. And your boss has more to do with your future than the company you're working for, your responsibilities and everything else. If they love you, they will push you ahead. I had so many people come and ask for raises over the years. Of course, mostly men. My theory as a boss is you get ahead of your valued employees and you raise them before they ever get to ask because employees will kill for you if you can treat them with that kind of reverence and respect and prove it by paying them more. They'll kill for you. They're loyal forever. And I've always been very lucky to be surrounded by people that are enormously loyal and it's no accident because I make sure I push money, recognition, whatever I have, opportunity, more valuable than raises, bonuses, whatever it takes to make them feel I am loved. That's what everybody wants. Do you really? So, um, that's a very important video. So I'd like to ask uh, who has any thoughts that they'd like to share based on that video. I'd love to hear it. Don't be shy now. How about you, Shania? What did you think of that video? Um, For me, it kind of resonated because actually I... Um, I actually quit my old job because I didn't feel valued by, mm. by my manager, like at all. And um, I got a new job, thankfully. Um, I start next week. But yeah, when she was just saying, yeah, when she was just saying about like a manager is supposed to like push you and supposed to value you, I that hit home for me because like at my old job, like I didn't feel that, like I didn't feel pushed by her. And it's like, my whole thing was I, I don't want to work for someone who was like, you're not pushing me to do better or like I don't feel comfortable to like be pushed because you're not pushing me. So it's like, what's the point of working for someone if you're not valuing me? So I think that also went into what, 
some of the questions that I do ask in some of my interviews, like I ask about like the work culture as well, because it's yeah. so important to me to know like how do managers push their workers when and during downtime, like how do you interact with your man and with your employees? Because some managers are just snobby and they just like, all right, get the work done. But it's like I want to be able to work with someone where it's like not only you care about us making the money for the for the um company, but you also care like about me. So um I'll definitely take into account what she said about getting a raise for the new job because I do want to raise. Everybody wants to raise. So <laughs> I'll definitely do that. But yeah, definitely. I think the point in her saying that a manager is supposed to push and appreciate their workers because I would have honestly stayed at that job. It's like I really didn't appreciate how she was just like treating me and I'm not going to be working for someone and I don't feel valued. That's just that's just not. Yeah. It. And here and here's the thing is that Sometimes as employees, we expect uh, good managers to make us feel valued and that they would appreciate us. But I'm actually going to give you the other perspective is we actually have to ask for it. You know, we have to ask for appreciation. We have to ask for raises. We have to ask for recognition. Like I shared with you my example before. And why is that? Is it because the managers are evil and and and, and conniving, trying greedy people? No, it's just not that maybe some, but listen, they have more work, more responsibility. They just want to do their job, do their job well, want their employees to do what they need to do so that they can look good to management, that they're completing their work, and they want to keep everything as a low cost. Now, what ends up happening is, you know, uh, companies want to keep costs low. <laughs> they don't, if, if they kept raising automatically raises to every person in the company without them then asking, they'd have to raise their prices and stuff like that. And they, you know, then people would go to another company. So their job as business owners, managers is to keep costs low. What your job is to do is to actually show them that you are, uh, that you are of value. And so that's why, all this whole training was about you keeping a degree, a, a spreadsheet of all your accomplishments, you asking, like you said, about the work culture, asking how, how often do people get promoted? How do you do well if you excel or exceed your goals? These are all the questions to ask. And the reason why I love that Barbara Corcoran video, and I shared that at the end, is because there's also... Uh, a kind of diplomacy, a kind of way of communicating to your managers because they're people too. They just say, hey, I'm working my butt off. Where's my money? Give me a raise. They're like, oh, disgusting. You know, like, I, I don't want to give you money if you're going to feel all title like that. And notice the language that she was using to say, listen, I want to stay here. I really love this company. However, I also want to make more money. Can you teach me? Can you share with me? What are my prospects? You know, I'd like to make this much more. Is that possible? Uh, you know, show me the things because even if the answer is no or not right now, the best follow-up question is, well, what can I do? Can you please give me the answers to the test so that I can excel and that I am worthy and deserving of uh, you know a, a raise or getting an extra money or can make that much more money. If that's the case and you're saying, I wanna add more value, I want to work harder, I want to do this, you know, show me the way, that is very reasonable. If you, Shania or anybody else is not getting that from your job, then yeah, it's time for you to check out, work for a place that can support you. Because if you're listening to this recording or part of this community, you're already dedicated to improving yourself, your personal professional development, that I already know that you guys are like the top 10%, you know, of people out there. So if they can't recognize what you, you know, <laughs> there's something wrong. So uh, again, be your own advocate, you know, be diplomatic, feel free to watch this recording, watch that video again, write down the language that she shared, because I think it will really help you. So I really appreciate it. Um, at this point, I'm going to put the post assessment, I put the link. So Please give any feedback. Uh, I know that we're a little bit over time, but I appreciate uh, those who you guys who stayed on. Thanks, Anaya, for the heart uh, emoji. Does anybody have any questions about this training, uh, uh, you know, about asking for raise, getting promoted that I can answer? And don't be shy because maybe the, one of the questions you might have, maybe other people are doing the same, dealing with the same thing. 
Any questions? All right. Hey, I have one, Tim. Go ahead, Henry. Um, the video, you're going to send those out, right? The video about Barbara Corcoran, what about it? No, no, not the video about the I'm actually talking about the training today. Oh, yes, yes. I will send a recording. I will send it out to everybody so that everybody can see it, even if you attended. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Thank you all. I hope that this training was valuable and that you can actually now learn how to delegate, <laughs> you know, uh, and if you have a bad manager, you can delegate up and that you can in start incorporating these questions and tools to help get you a raise and get you promoted. All right. Have a great week. Uh, we're going to have a training next week, uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all there. Okay? Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.